Um, next up, we're going to get a perspective from rheumatology, um, Dr. Fatima Azadi, who's an assistant professor also at University of Texas Southwestern. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Fatima Azadi. I'm, uh, I'm working at UT Southwestern. I see patients at UT and I, as well as Parkland Clinic. And I oftentimes see patients uh, basically in a uh, uh, rheumatology clinic and yeah, people who have other kind of organ manifestation. Uh, and they will tell you uh, about the NSK musculoskeletal manifestation of the sarcoidosis, which we oftentimes see in the clinic. Either it's true uh, MSK manifestation or it's like some aches and pains related to the age. So I will kind of you know go more into the details as uh, kind of what defines that. Uh, so sarcoidosis, kind of you know again, I've uh, thrown a couple of uh, basically uh, basic slides. The general uh, sarcoidosis, uh, which you already know that it's a systemic disease, and it is uh, basically involving every organ. And I kind of emphasize that every organ can be involved in sarcoidosis. There isn't a, in a, even a single organ that say can, is kind of spared from sarcoidosis. So that's why that you know you people are probably seeing multiple subspecialties, um, cardiac, pulmonary, because the lung uh, basically is the most uh, common organ that is involved in uh, cardiac uh, ophthalmology. But also oftentimes we do see you in our clinic because there are some non-specific symptoms uh, that we go through, uh, some of joint pain, muscle pain, sometimes people have some skin findings, sometimes you know people come with fatigue, low vitamin D, basically hypercalcemia that they don't know where it falls into, which subspecialty they should see, or sometimes there are medication that needs kind of monitoring. So we oftentimes you know see patients kind of to address those kind of issues. Uh, so if you were wondering where it's coming from, uh, sarco means flesh and uh, basically idos means like and osis means conditional. So that's where the sarcoidosis is coming from. And um, I always like to go back in time, kind of look at the history. The first case of the sarcoidosis actually was described by Dr. Hutchinson. And uh, he was actually at uh, King College Hospital in London. So in January of 1869, there was a patient who came in with two-year history of uh, skin disease. So that's actually how, and at the time, they didn't know what was going on. But later on, this patient kind of developed some of their symptoms. And that kind of led to the diagnosis of this sarcoidosis. And this is uh, the famous Dr. Hutchinson, who kind of uh, had the first case of sarcoidosis. Uh, so most frequently, as uh, some of my other colleagues mentioned, it kind of involves African American, and also it's seen in Northern European people too. Uh, it's in the third or fourth decade, uh, but also we see that you know at different ages too. And sex varies among ethnic groups. Basically, it kind of involves both female and male. We can see many, uh, basically, uh, wide range of symptoms. Some some of these patients are coming. Uh, we're seeing these patients in the hospital, do chest x-ray. We find that there are some lymph nodes, possible sarcoidosis. Patients are asymptomatic. And then there are some patients who have, uh, basically, life-threatening event, like, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Hobbs, as it was uh, earlier saying, that, you know, basically, cardiac arrest and those kind of, you know, situation that uh, really is uh, life-threatening. Uh, the clinical manifestation, I decided kind of to throw a couple of slides about the skin manifestation because we usually uh, kind of see these patients in our clinic too, is associated sometimes with the <clears throat> joint involvement. So skin manifestation is seen in 25% of people with sarcoidosis and there are basically two forms of um, skin manifestation. One of them is, uh, you may have heard of that, uh, e, uh, we call it erythromonadism. And the other one is lupus pernio. So what is the erythromonodosum? Erythromonodosum is uh, some of the lesions that are red, raised, they're very tender. And usually they are seen in the anterior part of the lower extremity, kind of in the shin area. And uh, these lesions, they may darken over time and kind of you know, turn into purplish uh, bruises like lesions. Uh, and uh, not every kind of erythromonodosum lesion is um, related to sarcoidosis. So uh, we, we tell the patients don't panic if you see this because we see referrals from uh, primary care that you know people have this and include the sarcoidosis. It can be seen in pregnancy. It can be seen in some of the infection, like the cervical infection, sometimes inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn or ulcerative colitis, if you've heard of. And sometimes it can see and be, be seen even in tuberculosis. This is uh, basically a lesion that I'm not sure that it, that's very obvious or not, but there are some kind of purplish discoloration, and if you kind of look at this patient and uh, look closely, they're usually uh, raised uh, and very tender. 
Uh, one of the other things that we see uh, in terms of the skin finding is lupus perineal. It's uh, also a raised uh, red or violaceous uh, infiltration of the skin. Uh, the lupus perineal is usually seen in the head, face, nose, and nasal mucosa. It can be seen in the cheeks and lips also, and also ears. And the skin biopsy, if we do a skin biopsy of that lesion, which a lot of times we don't do because it's uh, very classic, if we see that picture, and we usually do not like kind of to perform biopsy on the face, it does show that uh, the classic non-caseating granuloma that we see in sarcoidosis. And this is a picture of a patient with uh, basically lupus perineal. So getting into the musculoskeletal manifestation of the sarcoidosis, so about 15 to 20 percent of the patients with sarcoidosis, with sarcoidosis, they also have some joint involvement, muscle involvement or bone involvement. So we see arthritis basically, which is involvement of the joint. It can be in the joint and also it can be around the joint, uh, meaning that we do see a lot of tenosynovitis. We see uh, a lot of basically a kind of um, dactylitis, which I kind of explain a little bit later. Uh, or uh, we see it in the muscles, uh, like a muscle pain, it could be acute, it could be chronic, it was, could be seen as a nodule. And also we see a bone sarcoidosis kind of involving the bones, not the joints or the muscles and just in the bones. And also we see some, some other patients that who have basically osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia, which uh, probably you, you may have ever heard of those, and those are not basically actually true sarcoidosis or uh, arthritis. So how are we kind of telling that is this real sarcoid arthritis or is just related to the osteoarthritis that we get through the age or is fibromyalgia, is, fibromyalgia is a condition of chronic pain and that's very commonly seen in chronic disease and sarcoidosis is one of them. So usually when we get a referral as a, is this really uh, sarcoid arthritis, we go through a few kind of you know, things with the patient and kind of you know, see what, uh, which one they have. Sarcoid arthritis can be seen in two forms. One of them is acute, the other one is chronic. Uh, so the acute, basically, kind of arthritis is usually associated with bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy as well as fever and erythematosum. So there is a kind of a syndrome for this, um, a Lofgren syndrome, uh, that uh, we usually see acute arthritis with that presentation. And it, even we see that actually it's very good. Um, uh, it has good prognosis, I mean. And usually they respond to the treatment, and the treatment could be uh, basically just, just taking some pain medication like the NSAIDs, non uh, anti-inflammatory pain medication, or even nothing, and then it's kind of a self-limiting uh, process. And it goes away usually in two weeks to a month, but you know it can last up to four months too. Uh, the chronic arthritis is something that we see more often. These are you know, people who have had sarcoidosis for a long time. They come to us uh, at the clinic and have been complaining of pain everywhere, uh, mainly in the joints of the lower extremity. And we're kind of wondering if this is um, basically related to art uh, sarcoidosis or not. So chronic arthritis is usually seen in people who have also the other organ manifestation, like they have lupus perineal, they may have uh, lung involvement or they may have basically the chronic uveitis. It is, um, when we see that, it's of kind of poor prognosis because it doesn't respond like the acute arthritis. It doesn't respond very well to the treatments that we have. And usually back, uh, black race is uh, uh, the, basically the people that we see is uh, chronic arthritis more. Um, more than one joint is usually involved, and the joints that are involved actually uh, in sarcoidosis are the most common joint that it gets involved is ankles uh, in chronic and uh, acute. It doesn't matter. Ankles uh, basically are the first and most common joints that may get involved. And sometimes, you know, in uh, sorry, arthritis, if this kind of goes untreated and patients have had, you know, uh, joint pain for years and they haven't kind of, you know, taken any medicine for that, we do see erosive changes, meaning that the part of the bone kind of gets eroded, gone after years. And also we see it uh, deforming basically kind of arthritis in some of the peoples. We can see dactylitis. What is dactylitis? Basically, we have inflammation of the entire finger. They come with like kind of you know, say that the whole finger kind of swelled up. It was like a sausage, and that's you know basically the dactylitis. Uh, we can uh, basically see that if sometimes people come in with um, swollen joint, it could be ankle or knee. If we could, uh, we go in, we kind of aspirate the joint, to kind of send it for a study. And it does help us actually a lot, though there isn't anything specific in the fluid, but we check it for the cell count. 
The cell count usually tell us if it's inflammatory or not, because we do have a lot of people coming with osteoarthritis of the knee and ankle, and if the cell count is not inflammatory, meaning that usually it's less than 2,000, uh, then it's not related to inflammation arthritis. Then we say, okay, let's, this is osteoarthritis and uh, not basically inflammatory, and it kind of matters in terms of the treatment that you may get in the future. Sometimes the SI joint, the sacroiliac joints, which are the two joints in the back, the lower back, they can be involved, but that's very rare, and you usually see it kind of you know, involving only one side. So what is sarcoid myopathy? It can involve the muscles too, so the patients may come you know, with a kind of three forms of muscle involvement. It could be acute myositis or inflammation of the muscles, it could be palpable nodules, and it could be chronic myopathy. Uh, so acute myositis, uh, you may have heard of polymyositis or not. This is basically one of the other inflammatory myositis that we see, uh, one of the other autoimmune diseases. So it has a presentation like that, meaning that the people are coming, uh, they're very weak, uh, usually it's more weakness than the pain, and then we check the enzymes and they're very elevated, usually in the range of 10,000 or something like that. Uh, we can see nodular form. The nodular form is very rare, so in literature there have been only maybe 60 cases. Uh, so these are not very commonly seen in the uh, sarcoidosis. And some, uh, one of the other forms is chronic myopathy, which is the most common form actually that we see. People are coming with muscle pain. Uh, CPK may be elevated, the muscle enzyme may not, so it doesn't you know, help us that much. And it actually doesn't respond to medication that well to the steroids. And the diagnosis is basically based on muscle biopsy. So if we could, we go in and kind of you know, take a tissue, and the tissue should kind of show the, basically the pattern that we see in inflammatory myositis or muscle involvement. Uh, and then it's kind of the treatment is the same as treatment you know, with the, uh, any other kind of inflammatory arthritis, and I'm kind of you know, going into that a little bit more in detail uh, with the steroids and basically a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain medication. Going into bone sarcoidosis, we can see it in 1 to 15%, but the average is 5%. So it's not very common, but we do see that. We have uh, patients that follow up with the bone sarcoidosis. These are usually the people that, again, they have also other manifestation of the sarcoidosis. So it's not that they're just coming you know, with the bone sarcoidosis alone. Usually they have a lupus perdio, they may have uveitis, and they may have uh, lung involvement too, and they mostly have. And uh, when uh, the, it, it's actually when it's there, it shows that you know the disease is kind of more chronic and more progressive. Uh, the bone uh, disease basically is also more common in uh, the black race, and also people who had skin disease, they're more susceptible, uh, specifically lupus perineo, they're more uh, kind of susceptible to get the bone sarcoidosis. And half of the patients are asymptomatic, actually. Uh, so it's not, it's kind of, you know, just found incidentally if we get an x-ray of the, let's say, the lumbar spine, we see it there, or a hand x-ray. The most common lesions that we do see is a cystic pattern. It could be cystic or sclerotic, the pattern of the bone involvement. And usually we get a hand x-ray if there is actually, uh, if uh, there is pain in those joints. People are coming and they say the knuckles are hurting or the whole finger, uh, the joints, and then we get an x-ray, and this is the picture of uh, basically uh, a patient with uh, sarcoidosis who had this uh, cystic involvement. I'm not sure where to put laser. Uh, we see kind of this lacy pattern here. This is a lacy pattern of involvement of sarcoidosis of the, basically, the hands. Uh, so there isn't much of association between the sarcoidosis and some other uh, autoimmune disease. In autoimmune, basically in rheumatology clinic, we see a lot of overlap patients, meaning that they have one disease and over time they kind of get some other things too. But sarcoidosis, not really. We don't see many things, you know, with that. We may see Sjogren, ankylosing, spondylitis, or scleroderma, but these are very rare. So there have been some people who've been positive for CCP, that's a basically test that we check for rheumatoid arthritis and they're positive, but most of the studies uh, or kind of, you know, those uh, patients, they've shown that they have also RA, which is, can be seen in kind of, uh, it could be seen in sarcoidosis, but very rare again. And uh, getting to the treatment of uh, sarcoid arthritis, how do we treat this condition? So people are coming with acute sarcoid arthritis or chronic, um, basically, arthritis. Acute, as I said, is usually self-limiting. It gets better over time. 
But uh, what to do when we have uh, basically the chronic uh, involvement of it, you know, the joint? They're coming with chronic disease, and the, you know, the ankle or the knee is swollen, it's been months, and then they need some treatment. Usually, and we'll look at the other organ involvement too, because we kind of work in, you know, with um, other subspecialties, kind of, you know, come up with one medication that works uh, with the other organs too. So we usually look at those. If there is a lung involvement, we take it into consideration. If there is a cardiac involvement or basically the eye involvement, also we look at that and uh, kind of include, you know, decide on the medication. But generally, we start with uh, some pain medication, the non steroidal like ibuprofen, Advil. Uh, we usually try them for a good period of maybe two weeks or four weeks. If they're not responding to that medication, then we may throw a low dose of cortisone uh, or a steroid, prednisone. Uh, so first, actually, we start these patients on a bit higher dose, and by higher dose, I just mean 10 to 20 milligrams. That's, that's the, basically the dose that is good for sarcoidosis. It's not like, like you know some other kind of diseases that we treat that we usually treat with very high dose. Sarcoid arthritis, uh, they usually respond good to even low dose of a steroid. So we start with 10 to 20 milligrams daily, and then we, you know, kind of, you know, see how they're responding. If they're responding in, you know, a few weeks, that's good. We start tapering it, and then if we can get to below 7.5, that's the range that the, the dose that usually we feel comfortable, and we kind of consider it low dose. If you get there, we're, we're very happy with that. But if basically we see that, you know, we see them and that they're not okay, uh, or they say they have responded, but not quite well, then we add a medication, which is a very mild anti-inflammatory medication called plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. We uh, put them on a low dose of uh, steroid and the plaquenil for a few months, usually three months is the mark that we kind of, you know, see these patients evaluate again, and if they're not responding to that, then we may try cautious, and cautious is also another medicine that is kind of used for inflammation. So let's say these patients are coming, again, they're having inflammation, inflammation markers are high, and we see joint basically uh, involvement or swelling of the joints. Then at that point, we are going to the first line treatment, immune suppressant medication that we use for arthritis, and that would be methotrexate. Methotrexate is the first line uh, that we try. Obviously, if there is a lung involvement, our kind of, you know, the uh, colleagues in the pulmonary department, they do not like methotrexate much because of, you know, the lung issues and kind of some of the side effects that it may cause in the lung, kind of interstitial lung disease. Uh, but uh, if they don't have that involvement and the lung is quiet, we try that first. If they're not responding, let's say that, you know, we've tried methotrexate, we've tried steroid, we've tried, you know, basically the colchicine or plaquenil and they're still active, then the uh, medication that we go to after this would be biologics. And from the biologics, actually, we choose infliximab if there is uh, no contraindication from you know other point of view, the other colleagues so that they're seeing the patients. So infliximab is the medicine that actually we try first. And uh, so this is again kind of to overview, you know, what you're kind of treating these patients with, initial therapy with NSAIDs, and then the, the resistant low dose glucocorticoid, and then plaquenil, and glucocorticoid if they're not responding, adding colchicine, and again, if they're not uh, responding and resistant, we add methotrexate and infliximab. So why do we choose infliximab? And that I'm talking only about kind of, you know, the uh, musculoskeletal manifestation and my colleagues, you know, in other departments, they may have some another opinion about, you know, other medication. Uh, etanercept or Embrel, that doesn't work well for arthritis. And actually there have been a few cases that kind of, you know, uh, we've seen that it, it causes a granuloma itself. There are case reports, of course, but, uh, and also there hasn't been a very good kind of, you know, outcome of adalimumab or Humira. You may have heard of that for sarcoid arthritis. So if it's just a sarcoid arthritis, uh, we prefer infliximab, other than other uh, biologics. And uh, I, uh, this is based on, you know, one, this study, this is actually kind of the largest study, as you may know, that there aren't many studies with, you know, with sarcoidosis because it's a rare disease that showed infliximab has kind of, you know, better uh, outcome compared to uh, other medication. I just want to, you know, address this issue which comes a lot actually in my patients in the clinic, uh, the calcium and vitamin D. As you may know, um, patients with, this is uh, actually common and this is, this is not just related to MSK, rheumatology, you know, uh, pulmonology or anything. So any patient with sarcoidosis can deal with kind of, you know, this problem of how are they kind of, you know, treating, how should they do in terms of, you know, the calcium and vitamin D. Because we do have patients that are coming to us and saying that, uh, 
and their doctor told them not to take vitamin D or not to take calcium because it makes your calcium higher and that kind of you know, puts you more at risk. So there have been studies basically, and I'm going to kind of you know, tell you why, basically if you're kind of scared of giving the vitamin D or sarcoidosis to, to, to the sarcoidosis patient. And the logic behind that is that the granuloma in sarcoidosis expresses an enzyme, which is called 1-alpha-hydroxylase, uh, <clears throat> which transfers in an inactive form of the vitamin D to, to the active form. And the overproduction of that one actually causes basically hypercalcemia in sarcoidosis patients. So the granuloma itself causes hypercalcemia. So what if we give these patients you know, more calcium or vitamin D? And as you probably have, yeah, most of you have kind of, you know, um, basically had this corticosteroid uh, kind of challenge. We give steroid to, to, to the sarcoidosis patients as a first-line treatment, so more at risk of osteoporosis. And then um, what should we do? Should we kind of tell them to take calcium vitamin D? And you, re you may be also surprised that you know, how many people even in Texas have, that are low in vitamin D. Uh, so should we supplement that or not? So basically, uh, uh, there has been studies, and uh, kind of a, there has been one of the largest studies that they did, and they, they kind of included 301 patients with sarcoidosis, and they kind of supplemented them with calcium and vitamin D. Five out of uh, 104 calcium uh, uh, vitamin D supplemented patients developed hypercalcemia, but also it was not the cause of hypercalcemia in those patients. Patients without calcium vitamin D supplementation actually at higher risk for active disease and developing kind of hypercalcemia. And also, this study showed that if they're low vitamin D, uh, they have more disease activity. Uh, so, and it could be a potential risk for basically kind of having uh, kind of poorer prognosis and poor outcomes in sarcoidosis patients. So what is the conclusion? Vitamin D deficient sarcoidosis patients should, should be supplemented. So we supplement these patients with vitamin D and so far it ha there hasn't been any study that's showing that you know, it causes more hypercalcemia. So in conclusion, just uh, you know, kind of to overall, uh, going uh, through everything, outcome of sarcoidosis varies. Many people recover from the disease with few or no long-term problems. Uh, more than half of the people who have sarcoidosis have remission within three years of the diagnosis. Usually that's what we see. Remission means the disease is inactive, but it can return. And please have in mind that there is no cure for sarcoidosis, but remission is as good as cure. So if you go to the remission, that's as, as good. Two thirds of the people who have the disease have remission within 10 years of the diagnosis. And people who have Lofgren, I told early, earlier, trial of erythematosum bilateral hyalur lymph nodes and uh, basically arthralgia uh, usually have remission. These are people who come acutely, they're very sick, but they do have kind of you know, the good prognosis. A relapse one or more years after remission in less than 5% of the patients. And sarcoidosis leads to organ damage, but about in one third of the people, damage may occur over many years and involve more than one organ, as kind of you know, going through that. And rarely, rarely it can be fatal. That usually as a result of complication of the lung, heart, and the brain. So these are the three organs that kind of you know, mostly uh, cause the complication. Poor outcome more likely in people who have advanced disease and show little improvement from treatment. These are people who are resistant to the treatment. And certain people are at higher risk for poor outcomes from chronic long-term sarcoidosis, people who have lung scarring, heart, or brain complication, or lupus perineum.